Hello, welcome to the Elizabeth Nay Museum. My name is Oliver Franklin. I'm the museum site coordinator here. I'm a, uh, an employee of the City of Austin's Parks and Recreation Department uh, who has managed this site since 1941. Um, it was actually established as a museum in 1911, making it the oldest art museum in the state. Um, we'll tell you a little bit more about that in a few moments. Um, but it was primarily known for being Elizabeth Nay's home studio uh, here in Austin. Um, this here is Elizabeth Ney. She was born in 1833 in Munster, which is a small community in Germany. Her parents are up here on the wall behind me. They are, that's the oldest pieces we have in the collection. Uh, they were made by Elizabeth. Um, they were a very devout Catholic family. Um, she had several siblings. Uh, the parents had intentions for rather conventional lives for their children. Uh, Elizabeth, as a youngster, seemed different from everyone else, and at the age of 13 said, I will be a sculptor. Um, and her parents thought that was ridiculous. Uh, they told her so, and, and uh, she then mounted a hunger strike. Uh, it was very severe. She became quite ill. They called the bishop to come and talk her out of it. Uh, the bishop met with her and came to her parents and said, I'm sorry, but you'll have to compromise here. There is no talking her out of it. So they decided to send her to Munich, which was a uh, comfortable, um, not far city, uh, very Catholic city, uh, not Berlin, which is where Elizabeth wanted to go. Berlin was way too big, way too complicated, and way too Protestant, and it was um, very free thinking, and that was not a place for their daughter. So she went to Munich. Um, she was to live with family friends and have private tutoring. Well, she applied to the Royal Academy in Munich, um, which was a, a, an extreme notion because they'd never accepted a woman before, and why would they start now? She applied three times. Finally, on the third time, they said, okay, we'll take you as a provisional student, um, and uh, you'll be given separate um, uh, resources and so forth. Uh, but she proved so talented that within two years she graduated at the top of the class. Uh, and the school said, you must go on and go to Berlin after all, we shall help you. So she went to Berlin. She enrolled in the school in Berlin, got a scholarship, um, excelled, as was not too surprising for her mentors there in Munich. Uh, she got new mentors in Berlin, very significant mentors. and. Uh, became a very formidable student and uh, graduated again at the top of the class, the only woman, the first woman. Um, now, making a business was a different project entirely, or at least making a living as a, a sculptor. She knew that you had to do something really big and make it good so that people would notice it and that would get you on the landscape. This piece here was the piece that would do that for her, Arthur Schopenhauer. Um, was a very was was a very uh, significant figure in the Berlin intelligentsia. He was sort of the pinnacle of the philosophical community. Uh, he uh, was a very cranky fellow and had a rather dour look on life. He also had very low expectations of women. Well, when Elizabeth showed up, she was petite. She was rather young looking for her age, which was young anyway. Um, and she was, uh, had her hair cut short, which was very, very unconventional. She was an unusual person, for sure, and she played those cards. Um, and he was, he was not impressed. Um, three days of her sitting in his office, waiting for him to say yes, he finally admitted, yes, okay, you can sculpt me. Um, he sat down, and she got to know him because she intended to get to know her subjects to make the story as round as possible and convey personality in her sculptures as well. Well, the more they got to talk, the more he became, he became, the more impressed he became. He, he was astonished, actually, by how impressive this young woman was. She was very intellectual, very capable, very gregarious, very loquacious, very um, schooled, um, very intelligent and very talented. And she completed the sculpture and it became quite successful. And he himself 
was very, very pleased with the product. Um, she went on then to become a very famous sculptor in Berlin. The uh, royals took her uh, um, to sculpt them, uh, intellectuals as well, uh, philanthropists and so forth. Um, among them uh, are some very interesting political figures, like for instance, Giuseppe Garibaldi of Italy uh, and uh, Bismarck, the Chancellor of Prussia. Now, it's a very complicated time in German history, or well, really in European history. The, uh, the whole, the realm was dominated really by France, uh, and everyone was afraid of France's ability to sort of walk in at that point and take over. Um, they had done so in the past, uh, and so the Germans, the Prussians, wanted to become a large unified state so that they could manage the French and had their own uh, uh, visions as well of grandeur. And the Italians had become an, a nation of uh, a, a larger nation as opposed to a bunch of monarchies. And uh, they were allying themselves with the Germans in order to forge uh, a wall for, for France. Now, in the meantime, you had King Ludwig. King Ludwig II of Bavaria was alternately known as the Dream King or Mad King Ludwig, depending on your perspective. Uh, he was a very great believer in the arts. He spent a lot of money on art and architecture. And he felt that the more beauty he could bring to his subjects, the better off everyone would be. Um, of course, that's a rather fiscally challenging perspective, but he, uh, he felt very strongly about that, and Elizabeth did too. Uh, Elizabeth then, amazingly enough, became his court sculptor. This piece was made by her at his uh, castle of Neuschwanstein, which is in Bavarian Alps, and it's quite a, a spectacle. It's actually the model for Cinderella's castle at Walt Disney's uh, Disneyland. Uh, in any case, um, she became very close to Ludwig, um, but she also had this very strong relationship with the Prussians and with the Italians, and she got very complicated. She, it became very complicated for her politically. Um, we don't exactly know why, but she was sent a letter, and it said, we must talk, and it was the Prussian police, at which point she said, I better get out of Germany, and she did. She was pregnant with her first child, she left with her husband, whom I have not talked about yet, uh, but uh, she left in a hurry, leaving nearly everything behind and headed for the United States. Now, when she came to the United States, she, they landed in Georgia, the state of Georgia. They landed in a, uh, a rather effete uh, community of um, intellectuals and nobles. Uh, it was not very well arranged, not very well prepared, and eventually it fell apart. Uh, the folks largely could not survive in the atmosphere that they had chosen. Uh, but Elizabeth and Edmund, her husband, were very hardy folks and very resolved. And Elizabeth and Edmund decided that they wanted to live even further out on the frontier um, and have an idyllic existence there. So, that was the impetus behind them moving to Texas. They bought a property near Hempstead, which is near Brenham. It was an abandoned antebellum plantation. Um, it had seen better days, but it was still 1,100 acres of beautiful farmland, very pretty land, and it had a rather grand, if dilapidated, main building on it that would become their home for the rest of their life. It was known as Leando after the, the Spanish land grantee that owned the property in the first place. Now, Hempstead was not Berlin. It was a beautiful country and it had a productive farm, but frankly, they had no idea what they were doing buying a farm. They honestly had no experience running a farm. Uh, it became much more complicated than they thought, and Elizabeth had been given the 
task to run the farm. Now, uh, Edmund, her husband, was a philosopher and continued to write and was often known as the hermit philosopher of the Indo because he was very reclusive. He did not run the farm. He mostly wrote. He was also a medical doctor and he uh, occasionally served as medical, uh, medical services in the community. But it was a very difficult life uh, for both of them. She particularly, because she was so extraordinarily different. Um, she was, um, well, they both were really. They were very, very, very unusual people in Berlin, let alone in Hempstead. Um, one of the things that was quite remarkable was that they never admitted to being married. They actually never admitted to it. Elizabeth, in fact, never, never wanted to be married, but she agreed to be married on the condition that no one ever knows that they were married. Uh, in fact, she would call her husband Dr. Montgomery and he would call her Miss Nay until the day she died uh, in public. That would be in, 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 when people were around. Um, and um, they introduced each other as dear friend, that my dear friend as opposed to my husband or my wife. Um, now, it was added to that was, um, and that was shocking, of course. Added to that was the fact that their firstborn son, Arthur, died of diphtheria at the age of three, shortly after moving to Leando. They buried, they burned the body on site and then buried it on site, the remains. The neighbors were abhorred. They thought, all sorts of rumors were spread around, the main one being that Elizabeth was a witch. Did not help things at all. Um, she had a very lonely existence there, and it was very challenging running the farm. Her surviving son grew up and became a very uh, bit of a difficult child, um, and their relationship soured and became relatively non-existent non by the time he was in his late teens. Uh, although she tried, she tried very, very hard to uh, manage his life. He rebelled every every attempt. Um, and finally, he joined Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders in an attempt to, to basically disappear. Um, so, in 1892, um, with her second son gone, her first son dead, and the, and the plantation uh, exhausting her, she decided that she had to start sculpting again. She had earlier decided to quit, but she found out it was a great commission that would be to do the sculptures of Sam Houston and Stephen F. Austin for the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. It was a big commission. They paid $33,000 to do these two sculptures in marble. Um, and there was a big competition and she won. Um, she then used the money to buy this property that we're standing in and build the first part of the building, which is the room we were in a moment ago, uh, and produced these two sculptures, which ultimately wound up Texas State Capitol. Um, she had every intent. She said, I have sculpted the great men of Europe, now I shall sculpt the wild men of Texas. And she did. If you look over here, you'll see a number of busts of uh, prominent senators and governors um, uh, that she uh, got to know and sculpt. Some she knew better than others. Some were great supporters, like uh, Orrin Roberts and others she didn't know very well. But she became quite the figure in the city of Austin. What's also very interesting is the city of Austin at the time was a much more open-minded community than even, even as now than it than was East Texas. Um, Austin found her eccentricities fascinating. Um, she was uh, wildly different, um, unashamed to be wildly different. Also, however, brilliant and again had an amazing backstory and was amazingly talented and um, just and was truly uh, a cult of personality. She was an, a very uh, uh, charismatic individual um, and she became a real fixture in the city. In fact, some would say that she became one of the moving, uh, one of the one of the more important figures in this, the history of the city of Austin in terms of giving Austin its 
very colorful, very um, remarkably kind of individualistic nature. Um, she had already become very involved in creating things like uh, the Academy of Liberal Arts and uh, educational support programs, and was very earnest about trying to create a school of fine arts here with the University of Texas. That never happened, at least not in her lifetime. But she did create a great deal of sculpture. She had some very bad years, though, too, some very, very rough years. It was not as easy as she thought it was going to be. Um, she had some competition. There was a man, a young Italian man named Pompeo Papini, who you may have heard of, who would continue to, uh, well, who arrived, was very young, and um, got a lot of the jobs that she had hoped to get. But, as I said, she persevered, she persisted in uh, her uh, attempt to make a living here. Um, her husband, she never was able to convince to move to Austin. She was really hoping for that to happen. In fact, in 1902, moved here, uh, sold her sculpture, I mean, sold her properties in Berlin that she left behind. Uh, and that gave her the money to add to this building. This is the portion we're standing in now. It was added in, 19, in 1902. She also brought the sculptures that she left behind in Berlin at that time. Um, over here, you can see the main sculpture that we looked at a moment ago, Prometheus. Prometheus was uh, a sculpture she made for, well, in the studio that was provided to her by uh, King Ludwig II. It was a metaphorical, allegorical piece, of course. Prometheus, you know, was chained to a rock for eternity by uh, Zeus for giving fire to mankind, which, which fire, of course, has the metaphorical value of self-awareness. Um, it's really very interesting that this was considered by her to be one of her masterpieces. It was never finished in marble, I would add. Uh, the way these pieces were done was they were made in clay, then made, replicas were made in plaster, the clay would disintegrate, the plaster would be the model for the marble. This is plaster, it was not ever made in marble. It was shipped in 1902, along with most of this other work from Europe, in the shipping, the arm broke off. The last thing she did in her life was reattach this arm, and as she was working the plaster, she had a heart attack. Two weeks later, upstairs, she passed away, and would be buried at Liendo, where her husband, several years later, would be buried at her side. Um, he did outlive her. He sold the house to a woman named Debrell, Ella Dancy Debrell, who then, with her friends, founded the Texas Fine Arts Association here at Elizabeth Nay's home studio, also owned by Elizabeth as Formosa, but renamed at that time as the Elizabeth Nay Museum. And um, we would it has been many, many years here, and uh, her, her goal in life was to uh, inspire people by her work, and that is our intent as well, to inspire her by her work, inspire you with her work, and inspire you with uh, her stories, um, and those of the other occasional art shows we have and so forth. So we look forward to seeing you here at the Elizabeth Nay Museum. Thank you very much.